Look all around the world at the state of our society and climate. Superstorms like Harvey and Irma crashed into Texas and Florida, smashing rainfall and wind records, and a large 8.1 earthquake in Mexico caused devastating damage. For more than 10 years, our planet's climate has been changing at an alarming rate when compared to geologic records, with increased superstorms, earthquake, and volcanoes worldwide. At the same time, the media focuses our attention away from all of this towards celebrities, icons, and war to divert from the truth. So what really is the truth? As tides around the globe begin receding at a shocking rate, as seen in Florida, Brazil, and Egypt, and large earthquakes and volcanoes increase, we all deserve to know what's really happening, and if an outside force is actually to blame for all of this. We must not shy away from this information any longer, for a time of great change is upon us that has been written about for thousands of years. To understand what's happening, we must first go back to the earliest developed human civilization on Earth, known as the Sumerians, in what's today known as Iraq. The Sumerians represent the first civilization to develop advanced writing techniques, as well as tracking events and chronicling our ancient history. The Sumerians claimed that their knowledge of the stars, writing, agriculture, and social structures were all lowered from heaven by great gods who came from a planet with a long elliptical orbit known as Planet X, or Nibiru, meaning the crossing. The name Nibiru is derived from the unusual elliptical orbit that the planet follows, which takes it through our central solar system every 3,600 years. The Sumerians left behind records indicating the existence of this planet in cuneiform writings and cylinder seals. The most famous of these is known as VA-243, which shows a scale model of our solar system, which includes our central sun and the planets that revolve around it, including Planet X, where they claim their gods came from. Today, most of society has been tricked into believing these gods in Planet X are nothing more than a myth and fairy tale to hide the truth with laughter and ridicule. This clever tactic has hidden the real version of history and our origins for generations until over time has been nearly lost forever. It's time for humanity to awaken from its amnesia of all of this happened before us. The Sumerians called their gods the Anunnaki, which meant those who from heaven to earth came. The Sumerians wrote in detail about both who the Anunnaki were and the events that led to their arrival on earth hundreds of thousands of years ago from Planet X. In these early cuneiform writings, such as the Atrahasis, we learn about two brothers known as Enki and Enlil, who bitterly fight over the direction of humanity and provides details of the disasters caused by the crossing of Planet X. Much of the turmoil revolves around these two rival families and how this mysterious planet has shaped our story. Enki was a brilliant scientist and was known as the great magician and geneticist of the Anunnaki family. His symbol was represented as a dragon and serpent and was shown through the modern medical caduceus symbol. The name E-N means Lord, with Ki being the original name of our planet before it was called Earth, which was later renamed for this great being Ea, a previous name of Enki. Enki's half-brother Enlil, known as the Lord of the Air or Sky, and represented by the Eagle and Bull, was a polar opposite of his brother. His values revolved around a military and highly disciplined mentality, whose interests solely lie in the preservation and future of the Empire of Anu. All of the Anunnaki are named after this king of the gods who believes that he rules over Earth. The oldest and most important of these Sumerian writings is known as the Enuma Elish, which is a cuneiform tablet that speaks about our origin story and the devastation in our solar system long ago in the past. Found in 1849 in what is now the area of Mosul, Iraq, the Enuma Elish may be one of the most important pieces of writing in human history for the unaltered and extensive information given for the events of the ancient past. The Enuma Elish contains seven tablets, with the first five describing the turbulent celestial events that happened long ago when these Anunnaki royal gods acted out roles as the planets of our solar system like a grand play, with Marduk being represented as the planet X, known to the Sumerians as Nibiru, with Enlil represented as Jupiter. Reading from an excerpt from Tablet 6 of the Enuma Elish, it states, They bound him, holding him before Enki. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Enki, created mankind. 
on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Enki had created mankind and had imposed the service of the gods upon them, the task is beyond comprehension. The gods were then divided, all of the Anunnaki into upper and lower groups. He assigned 300 in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu and appointed them as guard. Enlil has always hated humanity and called them the beasts, referencing their primitive nature in compared to their DNA. These brothers were given ownership and responsibility over planet Earth and deemed themselves gods of everything beneath them. Most of our story and the extensive conflict throughout humanity all stems from the jealousy that arose between Enlil and his sons over the gifts within the human genome that were instilled secretly by using Enki's own DNA himself. We learn in the Enuma Elish in Atrahasis that the Anunnaki created humanity to ease the workload of the Ajiji, the workforce of the royal family, and to jumpstart the genetics of the Neanderthal with their own DNA to toil in the Absu, which we know is South Africa. Today, thousands if not millions of ancient mining sites dating to over 100,000 years old, utilizing advanced smelting techniques, have been found all over the region. This is the ancient reason why we still value gold nearly above all else, and is part of our long history of slavery on the planet. We are now just waking up to the truth of all of this. The original purpose behind the creation of Homo sapiens, through the eyes of Enlil, was to become a simple slave race, with only enough intelligence to comprehend basic orders. Even the idea of giving humans more intelligence through splicing their own Anunnaki DNA greatly angered Enlil and he fiercely opposed it. Unbeknownst to Enlil, his half-brother Enki ended up secretly designing a model of Homo sapien that was far too intelligent and possessed large amounts of Anunnaki DNA that could even rival their greatness as a species. Enki felt great responsibility and compassion for his creation and endowed Homo sapiens with an advanced brain and higher consciousness with shock centers of energy that could be manipulated from a distance in the future in case humanity became enslaved by ideas. When Enlil found out that Enki had given Homo sapiens the gifts of their intelligence and the right to free will through conscious expansion, he was furious and promised to enslave humanity forever and never allow them to know the truth of who they really are. Much of the current reality stems from the promise that has always been kept and is the purpose behind the inversion of so many meanings that lead back to the truth, such as the demonization of the snake, Enki's symbol. This realization of reality can be uncomfortable to accept, but necessary for growth and perspective. When Enlil was chosen to be the ruler of Earth, instead of his half-brother Enki, a promise that had been made for the ultimate slavery of humanity was orchestrated and carried out 12,800 years ago as the planet of crossing Planet X approached Perihelion and disaster occurred across the Earth, as told by Atrahasis, who was also known as Noah. This represented the great reset button of humanity and just the calamity needed by Enlil to permanently enslave humanity by tricking them through the conditioning of certain ideas and laws so that society would unknowingly give all of their energy away to these gods. The popular figure of the cross, represented by Planet X, meaning the crossing or the sacrifice on the crossing through Marduk's later trickery, was implemented into religion to become a massive control system of information in controlling the minds of all of society. A profound quote to explain this deception and control by Enlil, Ninurta, and Marduk on humanity comes from Barbara Marciniak, which states, The ultimate tyranny in a society is not controlled by martial law, but controlled by the psychological manipulation of consciousness, through which reality is defined so that those who exist within it do not even realize they are in prison. Underground cities such as Derinkuyu, Turkey, provide startling evidence to show the immense work involved by past cultures to seek shelter during times of violent earth effects from Nibiru. These underground dwellings have been found all over the world and speak to a forgotten chapter of human history leading back to our current time today where most of this isn't even believed or known by society to be real. In 1991, Dr. Robert Harrington, the chief astronomer of the U.S. Naval Observatory, took an 8-inch telescope to the end of Black Birch, New Zealand, one of the few optimal viewing points on Earth, and discovered a large planetary body approaching our solar system. Dr. Harrington calculated this planetary body to be approaching from below the ecliptic at an angle of around 40 degrees. 
A year later, in 1992, NASA gave two press briefings where they prepared the public for disclosure of a new planet in the far outer reaches of our solar system they called Planet X. Millions followed the events, awaiting the spectacular announcement of a new planet, only to hear silence. Before Harrington could publish his findings, he mysteriously died of throat cancer, and his research was quickly debunked as simply mathematical inaccuracies. All information and stories about Planet X quickly disappeared, and most forgot it even existed. Today, the Vatican Observatory continuously monitors the heavens from multiple telescopes awaiting the great return from heaven of the Anunnaki in Planet X. As we approach the fall of 2017, 3,600 years since the last crossing of Nibiru, the return and fulfilling of the prophecy of Revelation 12 seems imminent as events are unfolding across the world. As Planet X reaches perihelion near Earth, the changes we have been seeing will only increase in intensity. Great care must be followed by those living along coastal regions, especially those areas that are very low-lying and prone to flooding. Ocean levels will begin fluctuating dramatically during tidal phases, as well as increased earthquake and volcanic activity. Any large seismic activity could lead to a number of tsunamis along the coast and should be monitored closely. No matter what happens during this pass, records indicated will not be anywhere near as destructive as the past 12,800 years ago, which led to the end of the Ice Age and the Great Deluge. The biggest impacts from Planet X are likely not going to come from environmental disruptions, but from sweeping change across our social, monetary, political, religious, and scientific understandings. Reality as we know it will change forever once intelligent life is finally announced to the public. All of the silly distractions and ignorance that has plagued our world will melt away with astonishment and wonder once major discoveries in archaeology are revealed that lie under the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx, known as the Halls of Amente. Our understanding of who we are and our place within the multiverse is just beginning to be understood. This will be a time of weighing our consciousness and measuring our actions to reflect on what kind of being we are and how we can contribute to our timeline story. The Anunnaki gods follow the ancient rules laid down for the balancing of energy during zodiacal cycles. The time of Pisces featured a negative polarity, which is why we saw war dominate the planet for thousands of years. All of these changes represent the great metamorphosis of our time as we enter the positive polarity of Aquarius in the next several years to take the first step on our journey into the cosmos to join our galactic neighbors. What kind of society will we become? One focused on war and material gain by the eagle? or higher consciousness in the lost teachings of the great dragon Enki. Issues in my mind, especially the, the Genesis, book of Genesis, and, uh, and you're correct, uh, the 12th planet was Sitchin's first book, and he did spend a lot of time showing you evidence, showing you evidence, showing you evidence. Here's this tablet. Look at this one. You know, and try, trying to make it... Uh, he was trying to justify this unbelievable theory that most of the scientific people and the academics were dissing him over. Because he was, he was, you know, he was like a Wil, Wilhelm Reich, or uh, what was it? Uh, what was the guy's name who discovered Troy? Uh, I can't remember his name. He was a German, though. But, you know, the same problem with him is the academics dissed him. And, uh, you know, so he was pretty much out on his own with his own resources. And so I, I, I kind of saw that with, uh, with Sitchin as well. And, you know, uh, Sitchin, uh, he left himself open, I think, by writing The Lost Book of Anki and not giving any sources for it. I think it was a great book. And, it, and I think it wove together a lot of the pieces that he had from various sources to tell the, the, uh, the big story, which he did, did very well. He was a great writer. Uh, but I felt, never felt like I could reference that book without references, you know, so, so I never really talk about that one. But uh, The Twelfth Planet really opened my eyes to the Sumerian documents. And I'd been looking for a culture that had the earliest writing, so I could kind of go back to the source and go, well, where did this technological chasm come between different civilizations? That's how I was approaching it. And uh, then I read, uh, I think, Genesis Revisited from him. And this really made me go back and read the Bible again closely. 
And I started seeing things from the perspective now, having read all the Sumerian documents, that made a lot more sense to me. And with that perspective, you could differentiate the truth from a lie a lot more readily. And so when you go back and read Genesis 1, and you see that they created, that these gods, plural, created man in our image and our likeness, and then go read the Atrahasis account, where a council meeting of the Anunnaki specified exactly that, and that, and I mean plural, there were six men and six women on this council. So, you know, you start seeing those kind of correlations as well once you've read the Sumerian documents, which predated the Bible by a very long time. Uh, all of a sudden, you realize that uh, what you have there that's called the Word of God isn't completely true. And there were political agendas in writing that book. If you truly understand the circumstances, the... Hebrew people were in as they were being held captive in Babylon, where they first saw <laughs> where they first saw these documents, these Sumerian documents. Okay, so um, so what so what do we know? Uh, what, what what is your specific question about the prehistory of Nibiru, this planet that they say they come from? And then we can kind of walk from there into the main players and who did what to whom and how we ended up where we are now, but kind of will give us a platform to maybe discuss a little more great uh, you know uh correlations with uh how we go forward because that's you know once you realize all this stuff it takes a long time to process it and some people some people years okay this is like this is like tearing out every belief system you have and all of a sudden you're faced with this truth that's in stone that's sitting up in museums where you can either ignore it or synthesize it and realize what they were saying probably was not a lie even though it was called a myth by <laughs> by the conquering cultures, right? Well, and here's one thing that I'd, I'd like to make a point. As far as different religions and cultures and beliefs, that's one of the amazing things about being a human being is we have the right to think for ourselves and believe what we want to. So, you know, whatever take or, or mindset you have on religion, divine providence, God, if you believe in multiple gods, if you're an atheist, whatever, you know, this is tonight just an opportunity to hear about stuff that's been documented throughout history and the translations that are discussed have, you know, there, there's multiple sources that c collaborate and say, yes, this is what happens. So whether or not you want to believe it or it's 100% accurate, you know, that's up for debate and that's fine for you to believe. But a lot of this information is... It's, it's cutting edge because this is stuff that's been suppressed for thousands of years um, when the Crusades took place and, you know, anything that wasn't a part of the system church at that time, you know, was looked at as blasphemy, witchcraft, and people were burned at the stake, libraries, and tons of information was destroyed because of this. So a lot of this information and what you're talking about predates the books of the Bible and that's just incredible. So I would like to talk about the six women and the six men that were part of it, and we'll get into the, some of the names and the correlations of the biblical references, maybe the Greek gods, and maybe even if they connect to the, the Vedic gods, you know, Valahara and some of the, the Nordics and stuff. But my question was about Nibiru, is the, uh, the official version that I know about of the Anunnaki when they came to Earth was to look for gold. Is that correct? Well, that is correct. Um, if we start back on the prehistory of Nibiru, uh, there was a king that ends up as the main progenitor in the Anunnaki line that we like to include in the story because he was head of the Anunnaki council and his name was Anu. Okay, so Anu okay. was the original king or the, as far back as you can go, it was Anu. Right, and we're circa 450,000 years ago right now. And according to their records... Uh, one of the beings who was the prior king, his name was Lama, <coughs> excuse me, he, uh, he was discussing uh, problems in their atmosphere, whether to bolster their atmosphere to protect themselves against radiation using the volcanoes to reactivate them by firing missiles into them or to create a particulate solution to seed the atmosphere. And uh, this was a discussion they were having way, way back then because... Uh, you have to understand, in the, in the um, myths of Mesopotamia, there's a document in there called the Atrahasis, written by Stephanie Dolly. And the, the document is, I'm sorry, the Enuma Elish. There's Atrahasis as well, but the Enuma Elish is the Babylonian or the Sumerian cosmogony 
which essentially describes how our solar system came to be. And what, why it's important to them is because, according to the account, their planetary system, we call it the Nibiru constellation, all right? It looks like they have a mini sun and about seven planets total. And each planet may have a, a couple of uh, satellites. Okay. Well, anyway, this constellation somehow, according to their record, in this allegory of this epic battle in, in space with, think of the planets as billiard balls that are just flying around. Well, they're, they somehow got trapped into our sun's uh, orbit, in a retrograde orbit, according to them, that uh, they weren't in before. And after the first time through, they described all the things they were doing at the inner planets to prepare themselves for shielding radiation, have to blow this up to get it out of the way, all these kind of things. And we didn't really understand it until we got a little more scientific, I think. They were talking about using weapons that could split an entire planet. You know, and, and this, that re that reminds me of like a type 2 civilization. Right. So, so anyway, they had atmospheric problems without getting too lost there. Uh, they're in a 3600 retrograde orbit, according to them. They kept time in that method, you, in what was called a char. Even the Sumerian kings list, their reigns were listed in chars. Okay. And if you if you read the Sumerian kings list that was given to us by Barossus, it uh, it shows the first one having a, a reign of eight shars, which turns out to be twenty eight thousand eight hundred years. <laughs> as unbelievable as that is, and we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, but but keep that in mind. So they got trapped in this retrograde orbit. It gives them a, a platform, a moving platform, to see all the other planets that are already in this space. Well, they didn't get they didn't get out that easily. They apparently had some collisions about the second time around their their thirty six hundred year orbit, such that one of the satellites of Nibiru struck um, a planet that was in the place where the Earth is now. They called it Tiamut. It broke uh, part of it off. Uh, part of it became the Earth, and the other part became the asteroid belt. And at that point, one of the moons of Nibiru apparently got stuck in its orbit, and that's why. And they called that one Kingu, which is uh, our moon, which is unusually large for our planet. You have to admit. So anyway, so a lot of these stories they told in this Enuma Elish account, we're now verifying scientifically that what they said is true. And you know, this document is is quite old. So from that, from there, uh, they needed a solution because if you imagine a planetary system coming into perihelion with the sun every 3,600 years, what it would do to your atmosphere? It'd probably strip it of various uh, components that uh, would normally be there, either through magnetic effects, through plasma discharge and radiating it. Who knows? Okay, but apparently they had this need to keep bolstering their atmosphere, which you know, and I think. They knew in the long run it was a losing battle to continue to do this. They needed a long-term solution. And I think that's partly where the Earth came in, <laughs> in their long-term plans. But anyway, they, they had an, an occlusion account in their Numa Ilish with the Earth. So they knew about it, and they called the, the planet Key. Okay? And they counted from the outside in from their, from their perspective, since when they were out at Helion, they were the farthest planet out. So they counted inward, uh, the planets inward. And that if you count that way, the Earth is number seven. That's why I named my second book, The Seventh Planet. Okay. So uh, with this problem that they had, they, the king Anu decided to dispatch his chief scientist, who was called Enki. It was his firstborn son. He was uh, sent to the earth to do a couple of things. One of the primary things was to find resources to bolster the atmosphere back on the Buru as they were coming into perihelion with the sun again. So... Uh, some accounts show that he was looking in the Persian Gulf initially. That's where he splashed down and built the city of Eridu, which is right there where the Tigris and the Euphrates meet, running through the Sea of Reeds into the Persian Gulf. Okay? So that's, according to him, if he did that, when he said he did it, that city's 450,000 years old. And it's still sitting there in the desert in Iraq, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much uh, I don't know, like a pile of rubble. Jeez. Anyway, um, so that's pretty amazing. So he came... Uh, tried to get colloidal gold out of the oceans. Apparently, if it's already in a colloidal solution, or you can use chemicals to do it and derive it that way, you already got a powder-like form that you can uh, ionize in the atmosphere. It's very simple. Whereas, you know, if you take gold and have to smelt it somehow to get it to a, a powder form or a form that could be sprayed, think about how you would do that. Would you just make it little tiny particles that you'd spray up there? It'd be too heavy. It would just, it would just fall out of the atmosphere, right? So that'd be very, very small particles. So uh, so that was about 450,000 years ago. So uh, Enki uh, was 
Enki means Lord of the Earth, by the way. So his initial title was Lord of the Earth. Um, his half-brother Enlil uh, was still back on Nibiru, and he was born of his father Anu and his half-sister, Anu's half-sister, whose name was Arash. Or her other name was Ki, she was, who was nicknamed Ki Arash. So she uh, ended up giving birth to Enlil, and because she was a half-sister and because of mitochondrial DNA contributions in, in the purity of their bloodline, he was in line to rule. Enki was not. So, um, at this point, we're in the Persian Gulf, and Enki's trying to get gold. He brought a small band of workers with him, which he called the Ajiji. They also referred to him in the Book of Enoch as the Watchers. These were highly technical fellow gods that uh, generally ran spacecraft, low-Earth drones, uh, all kinds of technical things to watch the state of the simulator to report back to the higher ups, okay, whether it was an asteroid coming in or too much radiation, just whatever, okay, that's partly why they were called the Watchers. So they were they were there uh, to assist Enki in getting this gold from the Persian Gulf. Apparently, they didn't get it fast enough. Five thousand years elapsed. Uh, they ended up being vectored to South Africa, where the Atrahasis document picks up. So uh, at this point, um, apparently they weren't getting gold fast enough from the Persian Gulf, and they got vectored down to Africa where they could mine it more significantly. This is where the Atrahasis picks up. And in the beginning of this first tablet of the Atrahasis, it describes them casting lots you know, uh, to divide up the territories between some of the key players that we, we should lay out here. We've already mentioned Anu and Enki. Enlil was the other one. The one we didn't mention was the half-sister to both of them, whose name was Nin Hartzog. And later on, we'll find out her name was Isis in Egypt. She was the medical officer that accompanied them. She was very important. Because if, <coughs> if one of them had a child with her, it would be in line to rule. Because of this half-sister uh, mitochondrial DNA thing. So she was kind of a key player for that reason as well. Okay. So... Um, he, they end up casting lots. Enki gets Africa. Anu goes back to Nibiru. Enlil gets Mesopotamia. And the exemption is that the Temple of Eridu and the city that Enki built there with his original Ijiji watchers still belong to him. And apparently he had a garden there and he'd done all kinds of things in 5,000 years until his brother showed up. At this point, um, they've divided the territory. I left Inanna out. She got the Indus Valley. Okay, then Anki, Anki's in Africa. Oh, and, and the medical officer actually got some territory, even though she was a medical officer. She, uh, she got given the Bond Heaven Earth region up in the Sinai Peninsula that belonged to the Anunnaki. Now, this was the area where they had their, I guess you would call it their communication facilities. Okay. And also transport facilities for moving the ore back to Nibiru, whether it went directly or via a way station. I'm thinking of those in Peru or somewhere out there, they had those ginormous, like, uh, landing pads and very big, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, sculptures of different animals and stuff like that. Was that done by the Anunnaki? Like, was that to give them an idea from space? Um, it very well could have. Uh, there, there have been several races, I believe, that have visited the Earth and done prospecting here. And okay. I think there have been somewhat controversies between races of vying for those uh, uh, you know resources from the earth so you know resource wars and genetic wars both <coughs> excuse me okay so let's go back to Africa we've now got the main players they've divided the territories and these are Gigi watchers are signed up to uh, come down to Africa and mine the gold uh, manually versus this colloidal method they were originally planning to do from the ocean. Well, this is hard work. And they were 